Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Well, tomorrow, a big vote for U.S. Steel shareholders. They will vote on the proposed sale of the company to Nippon Steel. This deal, needless to say, is proving to be very controversial. Let's take a closer look now with Joe Doe, Bloomberg's metals and mining reporter. Joe, thanks for being with us. Is it true that you think the greatest stumbling block to getting this deal done is the union, the United Steelworkers? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. It is the union. And it has been basically since a few days after this deal was announced and the dust finally settled and people and by people, I mean, Nippon and U.S. Steel started to realize that the union was not going to uh, go out quietly in this. It's very interesting, too, because from what I've read in your reporting, Nippon has made overtures, put things in writing to try to allay the concerns that the union has, talking about more capital investment in some of these older plants in the states, along with the intention to honor the union labor agreements. Has Nippon not done enough? If you ask the union, they haven't. Uh, If you ask the shareholders, they feel like Nippon has done a lot. But I I think... Some of the reporting that myself and Josh Wingrove, our White House reporter, have done over the past many months is try to find what's, you know, in between reading between the lines here. And I think what's happening is Nippon feels like they've come out and made the promises they need to to assure that the union won't have a bunch of workers laid off and that the mills will stay open. The problem is they're not being specific enough. Right. And the union. Listen, they've seen a lot of jobs lost over the past you know, many decades. They've been through this before. And they're saying, you know, unless you can promise us that these jobs are going to be here and that these mills are going to have investments, they're going to keep them around for another generation. Right? I was talking to a number of steelworkers who said this, then it's going to be really hard for us to agree that you should be the buyer. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is on a state visit to the U.S. One of the things he did highlight even though he didn't mention this deal explicitly, he did say that Japan has a big role in America's uh, economy, being the largest foreign investor. Did it strike you odd that, that Kishida kind of avoided the Nippon Steel, U.S. Steel transaction? You know, it was something that we had all been talking about in the weeks leading up to this, whether or not he would discuss it. Um, it seems one of the reasons that Japan didn't spend much time dealing with this is because they did feel like there were other matters that were probably more important on state level. And uh, you had also had going into this, the president of the United States, Biden, had come out just the month before, just a month ago, and said, this has to be American owned and operated, and I support the American workers. So that took a major hit, right? You don't necessarily want to go into a diplomatic meeting in which a president has made very clear where he stands only to kind of hit a brick wall uh, mm. on, a, on a state visit that, you know, I mean, this is these don't come around often. I mentioned that tomorrow U.S. Steel shareholders are set to vote on this proposed sale today. According to Politico, the Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance says that U.S. Steel may have misled shareholders about the risk the federal government will reject this proposed deal. What is he talking about exactly? Do we know? I'm not exactly sure what Senator Vance is getting at. Uh, but I do know that the the shareholder vote is tomorrow. It is expected that it will be overwhelmingly approved by the shareholders. There's probably I was talking to a source earlier today who said there's probably going to be 97, 98, 99 percent approval of this deal uh, for the shareholders. It's a great deal. Fifty five dollars a share, which is probably ten dollars above what the highest expectation was before this deal was announced per share. Um, And really after that, what everybody's going to turn their eyes to next is the CFIUS review, right? Mm -hmm. The the review by CFIUS as to whether or not there's national security concerns in this deal. I also understand that the Department of Justice has opened an antitrust investigation into this deal. What, What would the DOJ be looking at? Yeah. And, uh, you know, my 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 colleagues and I looked into this yesterday and it what it is, is that the DOJ is doing its job effectively and it is looking at the assets that Nippon owns. And it has to determine if those assets would pose any sort of 
anti-competitive practices if they were to ultimately succeed at buying U.S. steel. Uh, as we understand it, the review is looking specifically at a joint venture mill that Nippon Steel runs with ArcelorMittal, which is the European steelmaker. It's the second largest steelmaker in the world. Um, and the question is whether or not that would have some sort of issues. The mill itself is, doesn't have blast furnaces. It doesn't, ha it doesn't actually produce raw steel. It rolls steel that goes into the automotive market, the construction market. And that is what the DOJ is looking into. Um, if they determine that there's anti-competitive practices, you know, they might suggest, hey, you have to sell your stake. Uh, but but I, I think it, to be clear, it wasn't that this DOJ investigation is looking at the deal, U.S. deal and Nippon. It is looking at Nippon's ownership of a current other mill and how that might affect anti-competitive practices if it ultimately succeeded at buying U.S. steel. So to circle back to the union, right now we know that they object to this transaction going forward. Can you imagine a world where the United Steel workers are able to negotiate something with Nippon Steel and for this deal to move forward? I think there needs to be a lot from Nippon Steel. I think we're still in, deep in the throes of, of early negotiation. A lot of people a month ago thought this thing was dead. Josh Wingrove and I, our big take yesterday uh, through a lot of reporting we've done, especially over the past month, showed that there is still a path. Um, the path, I think, would have to be some significant promises and specific promises from Nippon of the existing blast furnaces, blast furnace mills at U.S. Steel, which are run by unionized workers. And specifics are like, are you going to put a hot strip uh, continuous caster into Mon Valley or are you going to do some sort of power generation? What are you going to go do to the currently idled mills like Great Lakes and Granite City, which still have union workers there? Right now, Nippon hasn't really gone into specifics. And honestly, it's because if you think about it, a lot of companies, when they go to buy another company, it's not like they're doing all their due diligence before they buy the company. They buy the company and then they do more of the due diligence. They decide what they're going to keep and what they're going to upgrade. And that is really what's going on here, right? And the union's like, uh uh, nope, because we don't want you to buy this thing and then shut down a bunch of mills where our guys work at after you've bought us. And then, of course, done your due diligence after the fact, because then a lot of people are left out to dry on the union side. Joe, for the longest time, the rival steelmaker in the U.S., Cleveland Cliffs, was making a play for U.S. steel. Obviously, the Nippon bid topped what Cleveland Cliffs was attempting to do very quickly here, 30 seconds or so. If this were to come undone, does it go to Cleveland Cliffs? Is it that easy? No, it's not that easy. Cleveland Cliffs uh, could, you know, if the deal comes undone, they could make another bid for it, but they would still have to go through antitrust concerns. Those were the concerns mentioned in the proxy of the deal. Nip, uh, U.S. Steel said they think there'd have to be about $7 billion of divestitures for a Cliffs purchase to work. Cliffs uh, said, I think we think it would only be $2 billion, but it's obvious that there would be significant divestitures that would happen. And if that even happened, those divestitures would directly impact the United Steelworkers. Joe, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for making time to chat with us on this uh, bid on the part of uh, Nippon Steel. $14.9 billion proposed merger deal with U.S. Steel. Joe Doe there, Bloomberg Metals and Mining reporter, joining us from here in New York City via Zoom on Daybreak Asia. Let's get to our guest from our Hong Kong studios. Stephen Soon is with us. Stephen is head of research at HSBC Chianhai. He joins us, as I mentioned, from our uh, perch in uh, HK. Good of you to join us, Stephen. Thanks so much. We had an interesting conversation yesterday, uh, a couple of our colleagues and myself, around um, some of the monthly activity data that we're going to get next week for China. And we focused on retail sales in particular because we're trying to understand uh, the health of the Chinese consumer right now. Do you have a sense about the domestic, the, the, the story on domestic demand in China? Um, thanks for having me, Douglas. This is my uh, first Bloomberg radio experience. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, it's really uh, excited. Um, uh, regarding, you know, the consumption growth recovery in China, I would say uh, so far, if you look at the uh, festival seasons, uh, be it the Chinese New Year or, you know, a couple of days ago, the Qingming Festival or Tomb Sweeping Festival. Uh, in general, the uh, service-related and also catering-related consumption growth uh, have surprised on the upside and are actually quite strong. 
So that's the good side of the story, right? Um, but it's really a K-shaped recovery, if you will. Mm. Uh, on the negative side, you also have, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, property-related uh, consumption items uh, fairly uh, fairly weak here, uh, and probably that you can also differentiate between. Uh, the big ticket item and uh, small ticket item, and and then that's why uh, in general, there's still insufficient you know domestic demand, and as a result of that, uh, the government brought up this issue at the two sessions. Uh, they talk about how uh, they're going to roll out a um, uh, trading replacement sub- subsidy uh, programs in the coming in the coming days. As late as yesterday, I think one of the officials from NDRC. Uh, talked about how Ministry of Commerce uh, is actually uh, actively preparing the document and could be released in the coming days. Is that the Cash for Clunkers program? I think it's being called that, the replacement of certain household appliances, furniture, things of that nature? Uh, Yes. The program will cover uh, a wide range of consumer goods. Uh, You know, you you would have uh, Cash for Clunker on the auto side. You would also have... uh, uh, subsidy trade-in replacement uh, for home appliance, uh, home furnishing, for instance. Um, on, on the auto side, uh, that's really, you know, uh, quite exciting um, because if you look at China, uh, they have like, you know, over probably 300 million cars on the road. Uh, and out of that, 11 million autos, uh, they don't really meet with the emission standard these days, i.e. they're fairly old standards. Um, And out of that 11 million, uh, you have uh, 7 million units uh, that's older than 15 years, i.e. they have uh, pretty much reached that scrappage, you know, uh, time. Uh, So we don't know the details yet, uh, i.e. the magnitude of subsidy, but in principle, this should be coming from, uh, i.e. the uh, central government, local government, and uh, the uh, auto OEMs, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, hopefully, you know, this could be mature enough, which, you know, I think it's quite hopeful uh, to uh, turn around the story. The auto sales, you know, we were talking about single digit, probably one to two percent decline this year. uh, But with the new program, uh, most likely this could turn positive. I'm glad you're bringing up the EV issue because there's this sense that there is still so much excess capacity when it comes to electric vehicles. I know it's something that the Europeans are concerned about. And uh, recently when Treasury Secretary Yellen was in China, she talked more broadly just about the state of industrial overcapacity. But just as it, as it relates to electric vehicles, are you concerned that China is still at a level right now that's going to require a lot more consolidation, and maybe that brings with it a little bit more pain? Um, yes, I, I noticed the uh, the recent Yellen visit in China. Uh, both sides uh, clearly exchanged their views very frankly. Um, so the definition of overcapacity, I think, you know, each side um, probably has. Uh, their own definition, right? You know, from China's perspective, you just talked about the U.S. perspective. So uh, if I could, if I may, uh, the China perspective is that um, the Chinese manufacturers, they are uh, entitled to produce for global consumers. Um, so that, that's really where the differences, you know, are. Whereas, you know, Yellen, when she talked about the oil capacity, uh, she probably was referring to comparing to domestic consumption. Um, every single year, uh, the uh, the uh, the auto sales in China um, is about 18 to 20 million uh, cars, but the capacity is uh, significantly bigger than that, and hence you know the difference between uh, two countries and also the uh, renewed tension uh, between China and the EU uh, as well. So help me understand where China is right now in this AI revolution. I mean, we focused a lot about the the American companies that are leading in this field, whether it's in AI proper or some of the, the beneficiaries like the, the chip manufacturer NVIDIA. Where is China in this process of moving into the, the new stage of artificial intelligence? Um, Yeah, frankly speaking, it's pretty tough for China, right? While the U.S. has very strict uh, export restrictions in terms of uh, the type of um, uh, chips, AI-related chips they can get, 
Um, so the computation power side, certainly, you know, uh, China is significantly handicapped. Um, and then that's why in terms of the, the foundation models, uh, it's pretty much all coming out of, you know, uh, the Silicon Valley. Um, but the good thing is that, um, yeah, majority of the foundation model we have seen so far, you know, choose to do open source, um, which, you know, could help uh, the Ch Chinese software companies, you know, IT companies uh, to uh, quickly, ad you know, adapt and uh, play in the um, uh, the catch up, uh, especially in the AI agent, you know, i.e. the application side of things. Okay. Stephen, it was a pleasure to have you on the program. Congratulations. You did so well on your first visit with us here on Daybreak Asia. Stephen Soon, head of uh, research at HSB Qianhai, joining us from our studios uh, in Hong Kong. Our guest from our studios in Singapore, Prashant Bayani, uh, Asia CIO at BNP Paribas Wealth Management. Prashant, thank you so much for being with us. We were just talking a moment ago about this uh, tepid reading on overall economic activity in Singapore. Let's begin there. What, what's your view on how well the Lion City is doing economically these days? Yeah, if we look at lead indicators, I know the GDP was a touch under expectations this morning. Uh, but thinking about Singapore as a very open economy, of course. And if you look at Taiwan, Korea, other export data is starting to pick up. If you look at China PMIs, uh, in particular the exports that came out uh, just last week, were also a bit better than expected. So I think from that side, Singapore will start to benefit in the second half of the year as we see a manufacturing recovery. Uh, and, of course, U.S. PMIs as well. ISM is above 50 on the manufacturing side. On the domestic side, well, we, of course, we've had to get through the GST uh, and a little bit of a blip in inflation. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, we'll see. But we think unemployment's low. Consumer spending uh, will continue. So overall, we have a relatively constructive view on growth for the second half of the year uh, for Singapore. I'm glad you mentioned China. Next week, we'll get the monthly activity data for the latest period. Talk to me a little bit about your understanding of the reliance that the Singaporean economy has on China. Is is that beginning to decouple in any way? I mean, Singapore, of course, yes, there is a very strong trade relationship with China, the U.S., other parts of ASEAN, uh, including Malaysia. So that's going to continue. It hasn't materially changed. But I think where we've seen flows create volatility was, of course, during COVID and the tourism flows, which now are picking up with airline air flight capacity picking up within the region. So that is a help. Uh, I think overall, Singapore's position is solidified, of course, through COVID in terms of as a regional financial center. Uh, furthermore, when we think about global growth, it is very geared. So we just look uh, at the Taiwan export data, we look at the Korean export data, and we look at lead indicators like orders to inventory in China. And there is a correlation between that and Singapore export data. And Singapore, of course, has a strong electronics, semiconductor uh, industry as well. So uh, we are very much uh, in Singapore uh, reliant on some of the other countries in the region and, of course, end demand in the West. So when it comes to the West, you're managing money or at least guiding people who have uh, wealth in the APAC region, where to put their money to work. How are you viewing the U.S. these days? Yeah, overall, we've actually been overweight global equities, believe it or not, since October 22, when it was not a, not a consensus wow. call. <laughs> so we made a, <laughs> Good we stuck for you. our necks out. We Good. didn't get our necks cut off, luckily. <laughs> um, but uh, overall, within the U.S., we're being more selective on sectors. So the key is, as you know, the MAG7 or MAG4 stocks have really driven returns uh, last year and, of course, even year to date. But you're starting to see, if you look under the surface uh, from, say, mid-January, late January onward, other sectors outperforming. Because the key is to go higher, we felt, for the U.S. market, we need to see a broadening of sector performance. So if you look at energy, look at materials, you look at healthcare, you look at industrials, these kind of sectors actually have high, d d low double digit, high single digit returns here to date. Uh, and we think that we need that broadening for the market to go higher. And indeed, that's what drove the markets in the last six weeks. Mm. Uh, and tech took a little bit of a breather. So overall, um, we think we're sector driven. 
And of course, last year, you could have been overweight the U.S., but if you're underweight tech, you would have underperformed. Flip side now is we think, yeah, yes, we're, we might be neutral tech, but we're overweight some of the sectors we just spoke about. So is that based on an understanding of the role that the American government is playing right now in trying to stimulate the economy, the themes that you just laid out? And I'm hearing, you know, maybe EVs, maybe infrastructure, healthcare is in there as well. I mean, is this, uh, are you making a connection between what the federal government in the U.S. is doing and how it may be impacting the economy? That's correct. In my career, we've not seen this level of fiscal stimulus uh, from the U.S. government when unemployment's below 4%. Simple as that. So that does have a knock-on impact on the economy. Construction, if you look at manufacturing construction capex in the U.S., uh, it's really almost like a hockey stick in terms of compared to the last 20 years. So yes, of course, that plays a role in terms of some of the sectors we spoke about on the reshoring side and just general construction and fiscal stimulus. So it has some impact. And of course, uh, these sectors also were viewed uh, at their old economy sectors. And last year, with all the focus on AI, which of course, long term, we're bullish on as well, mm. um, it, these sectors were left behind. So, you know, I, I, it reminds me a little bit, and I'm showing my age, but, you know, coming out of 2000, we don't think we're in a tech bubble like 2000. Uh, but we saw a lot of value sectors become cheap uh, by, the, by March of 2000. So there is, there is some that the fiscal side does help some of those sectors. So when it comes to AI, maybe, you know, bubble is an extreme way of describing what we have seen. And, and I don't necessarily think that it's what people are describing it as. But I think there's a big question mark when it comes to the ROI for the companies that are investing in products, let's say, made by NVIDIA. They're building out these data centers. The expectation here is that they can begin training their AI models on whatever data they choose. But the question is whether or not there's going to be a benefit, whether the level of productivity justifies the expense. Is, is that fair? And is something maybe that you're concerned about? Yes. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's clear there are productivity benefits. Um, of course, it could take maybe longer than we think. There's a lot of studies on, you know, initially what the productivity benefits could be, but it's still too early to say. But it's very clear that these technologies do have both efficiency benefits and even top line benefits. So if you remember the metaverse, there was a similar hype at that time, but that that disappointed somewhat in its rollout period. This is a little bit different because it it creates efficiencies on the services sector. It's not just manufacturing sector. Mm. So that's a little bit different. So companies, as you know, they're lean and mean. They're focused on return on investment. So they're going to experiment and there'll be some, I'm sure, disappointments. But overall, we think there are benefits longer term, but this plays out over three, five, ten years, uh, the productivity benefits that come from AI. Uh, and, the, uh, and of course, uh, the rate of change is accelerating. Uh, but at the same time, we'll learn things <laughs> as things are rolled out as well that we need to improve. So Prime Minister Kishida is in the States uh, talking to President Biden yesterday at the White House. They unveiled a kind of some kind of cooperation as it relates to artificial intelligence. Prashant, very quickly here, when it comes to Japan, is the play something related to technology or is it is it different? Yeah, I mean, Japan, we've been overweight as well for a long time. I think it's both. Uh, Japan has a strong semiconductor tech industry, but we also like the domestic economy for economic rebound, inbound tourism, both, and also improving corporate governance now, which is well advertised. But you are seeing record share buyback levels in Japan. So we think for stock pickers, it's a great place still. Prashant, it was a pleasure to have you on the program. I hope it is a productive day for you in the Lion City. Prashant Bayani, who is the CIO for Asia at BNP Paribas Wealth Management, coming to us from our studios in Singapore. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. 